This morning is very exciting. We're about to begin a new journey into the book of Acts. After our series on the Sermon on the Mount, where we saw all that Jesus has called us to as his followers, now we will see how this is lived out in the power of God in us. In Acts, we will learn how our Lord's original followers were changed and empowered to live radical lives of faith and love, and we'll be inspired and encouraged by them in our own personal walk with Jesus. The title of the book of Acts is actually the Acts of the Apostles. This title has been around for many, many years since the second century, but there's nothing to suggest that this is the only correct label for this book. There is also evidence that another popular and ancient name was given to the book of Acts, and that is the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. And that is much more appropriate, I believe. As we'll see going forward, the book of Acts will show how the men and women who believed in Jesus Christ were filled with power, wisdom and confidence and holiness and every other good thing after they received the Holy Spirit. And we'll see how this Spirit-filled life in Christ is the true and amazing life of the new covenant that we've been called to. We'll see that Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he will not empower us to do. And that's why he sent the invisible, all-powerful hero of the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit. Truly, the Holy Spirit is the real good news behind the book of Acts from start to finish. Jesus promised to send him to his followers, and when he came, the world was never the same. Let's begin by laying a little groundwork and see some of the details behind this amazing book. The books we call the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts were obviously written by the same person. Here's how we know that. The Gospel written by Luke begins by saying, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So the writer of what we call the Gospel of Luke was writing to someone named Theophilus, which means lover of God. He wrote in order to accurately record the life and teachings of Jesus in an orderly account, so that his reader would know for certain that all they were being taught about Jesus was true and believable. Now notice the similarities between the book of Luke and the beginning of Acts, which says... The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Once again, we see the writer is addressing Theophilus and explaining that there were many infallible proofs of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The letters are addressed to the same name, and they both have the same purpose, to help Theophilus believe the good news about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. From the earliest days of the church, People agreed that Luke, who was a very close companion of Paul, was the writer of these two letters, and they were attributed to Luke from a very early time. As we also learned from our apologetic studies on Wednesday night, the book of Luke and the book of Acts both record many historical details that helped many people confirm the accuracy of the Bible. The detailed accuracy of these two particular books, with all of their intricate facts that have been proven reliable over and over, 
have led many to give Luke the flattering name, Luke the Historian. And the book of Luke and the book of Acts definitely serve as very accurate and detailed historical records of the life, words, and works of Jesus, as well as the history of the early church and all that was accomplished in the power of the promised Holy Spirit. The reason we mention the promised Holy Spirit is because long before Jesus came, God promised to send the Holy Spirit and institute a new covenant with his people. In Ezekiel, God said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. In Joel, God said, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And in Isaiah, God said, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. God's people had been eagerly awaiting these promises to be fulfilled because in the first covenant, only the leaders of God's people were actually given the Holy Spirit. That's what made these promises so special. Because now, in the new covenant, all of God's people are filled with his spirit and born again in God's power. Truly, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from the guilt of our sin. And the Holy Spirit cleanses our hearts from within by empowering us to obey Jesus. This is the real promise of the new covenant. Jesus reminded them of this promise before his death and after his resurrection. Here in verse 4 and 5 we read, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The Spirit had been working in them until now, but they had not been fully baptized or immersed in the Spirit yet. So Jesus was commanding them to wait in Jerusalem for that long prophesied amazing event. Because the prophetic verses about the Holy Spirit in Joel, Isaiah, and Ezekiel were also associated with the restoration of the nation of Israel in their immediate context, we read in verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? The apostles were thinking what most of us would have probably thought also based on the prophecies they knew from the Bible. Jesus was resurrected, and he just promised them that they would receive the Spirit in not many days from now. And in the context of the prophecies about that time was also the restoration of Israel. That's why this question was perfectly reasonable based on what they knew from the Bible. But Jesus answered them by saying, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put into his own authority. But... You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea in Samaria and to the end of the earth. First, Jesus explains that the appointed times and seasons for things like these were not really for them to know, and he focuses them on their primary mission. In the power of the Spirit, Christ's people are to be his witnesses, all over the earth. And in the apostles' case, they were to go in just the order that Jesus mentioned. They started in Jerusalem, and then they went to the surrounding province of Judea, then to Samaria, and ultimately to the end of the earth, or more literally translated, the farthest parts of the earth. 
the rest of the book of Acts is actually the record of how the apostles carried out this amazing mission statement in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Verse 9 records a moment that seems very sad to most of us when it says, Now, when Jesus had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. This is how the first coming of our Lord was ended. His resurrection was witnessed by over 500 people at one time. He was seen by his disciples and others for 40 days after his resurrection. And then finally, his first coming ends when Jesus ascended back to heaven to the right hand of the Father. This really does seem like a very sad day for them and us on the surface. Because if Jesus hadn't gone back to heaven, he would still be here for us to see and listen to. But amazingly, this was the beginning of a new and exciting chapter of human history. Just ten days after our Lord ascended into heaven, the central day of God's holy feast days arrived. And the world has never been the same since. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out on God's people and they received the power that Jesus promised them. In John's Gospel, Jesus said to his disciples, But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, Sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. The disciples were naturally sad that Jesus was leaving them and going back to heaven. But he told them it was actually to their advantage that he went away. Jesus explained that if he didn't go away, the Helper, who is the Holy Spirit, would not come to them. But since he was leaving, the Spirit would come. I'm sure that when they watched Jesus go away, these words were a comfort to them, along with his clear promise that the Spirit was coming. Jesus also explained what the Spirit would be doing when he came. The Spirit convicts the world of sin because we all need to recognize our need for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Once the Spirit shows us how we have sinned against God, then we understand why we actually need what Jesus did for us on the cross. Most people will not take a medicine that they don't know they need, so the Spirit reveals our sin to us, so we understand why the cross of Christ was necessary. The Holy Spirit also convicts the world of righteousness. By revealing to us all what Jesus taught when he was in the world and helping us understand God's word is perfect and just, and we must follow Jesus Christ to live in true righteousness. Before Jesus came, this was done by the law and the prophets. And when Jesus came, he revealed what righteousness was without any mediator at all. The moral lawgiver revealed the moral law directly to us. Once Jesus went back to heaven, 
the Holy Spirit picked up where Jesus left off. And he revealed God's moral law to us by putting the law in our minds and writing it on our hearts, just as Jeremiah prophesied would happen in the new covenant. Jeremiah recorded God saying, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The Spirit also convicts the world of judgment by revealing that the sentence has already been pronounced on Satan and all who serve him by living in sin. By revealing what sin and righteousness are to us all, and by convincing the world that the judgment is coming on all who continue in sin, the Spirit leads us to repentance and surrender to Jesus, and ultimately he leads us to eternal life. These critical jobs are all done by the Holy Spirit who came on Pentecost, and they're all directly related to obedience to God. Sin is disobedience, and the Spirit reveals what it means to disobey God. Righteousness is obedience to God, and the Spirit reveals what it means to obey God. And judgment is the consequence of disobedience to God, which we all must repent of if we are to be saved. These foundational truths are revealed to all people by the Holy Spirit, who is just as much our God as the Father and the Son, by the way. Remember, we are all baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they're all equally God in one being. Jesus then explains that the Holy Spirit, who he called the Spirit of Truth, would come and lead the disciples, and he would give his followers various prophecies about the things to come and guide them into all truth. Part of the way this was fulfilled was by the Spirit leading Paul, Peter, John, and others as they wrote the New Testament scriptures. And this was also fulfilled by the Spirit leading the individual churches with prophecies, words of knowledge, and gifts of discernment, and much more. Jesus said that the Spirit takes what is his and reveals it to us to glorify Christ in us. This is because as we grow in understanding of God's truth and are transformed by it, we live it out obediently in our lives by the power of the Spirit to the glory of Jesus, and we fulfill our purpose and exalt Jesus Christ as he deserves. All of these new covenant promises are clearly focused on the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Truth who leads every follower of Jesus Christ. And this is the real focal point of the book of Acts. Once God's people received the promised Spirit of Holiness, then they could truly live out the new covenant in Christ Jesus. He willingly gave his life so we could be forgiven and united to his Spirit. He also taught us how we should live in the power of the Spirit and then, by Christ's resurrection, he revealed the hope that motivates us to fully surrender to the Spirit. When we do, it's the Spirit who works in us to allow us to obey God's commandments and love him as he deserves to be loved. In verse 10, we see the apostles are staring up into heaven, and we can only imagine how long they would have kept staring there if God didn't intervene. We read, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So while they have their eyes fixed on the spot in the sky where Jesus just disappeared from their sight, Two men, as Luke says, in white apparel or clothing stood by them. The sense of this passage is that these men were angels who appeared to comfort and redirect the disciples. They explained that Jesus would return just like he left in the clouds of heaven. 
At this point, after this message, the disciples knew that they weren't meant to just keep staring into the sky there. So in verse 12, Luke records, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. Here Luke records that Jesus ascended from the mount called Olivet, or as it's more commonly known, the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives directly overlooks the Temple Mount. Just as the angel said that Jesus would return in the same way he went up, Zechariah 14, 4 through 5 also prophesies, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley. Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with you. This Mount of Olives, where Jesus ascended from, will be the same place where he'll be returning to one day in the near future. And when he comes back in his power and glory, he'll split the mountain in two, just like he once parted the Red Sea. And just like the reason behind the parting of the Red Sea, Jesus will split the Mount of Olives so his people can escape from danger and know that Jesus Christ is the Almighty God who delivers them. Well, back in our passage in Acts, we saw the eleven apostles all in an upper room in Jerusalem, and verse 14 records, These all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. First we notice that this group, which the next verse reveals was made up of around 120 disciples, was totally united in prayer in one accord. Jesus told them to wait for him to send the Spirit to them, and here we see how they spent those days waiting. By the way, we can calculate that there were 10 days of waiting for the disciples, by understanding God's feast days. We know that Jesus was resurrected on the Feast of Firstfruits, which always falls on a Sunday. And we know that Luke recorded that Jesus was seen by them for 40 days after his resurrection. We also know that Pentecost is 50 days from the Feast of Firstfruits, so if Jesus ascended to heaven on the 40th day, as Luke indicates, there would have been 10 days for them to wait in Jerusalem as he commanded until the Spirit came. We can only imagine the mix of emotions in the disciples at this time. They were probably sad that Jesus was no longer with them. They were surely excited as they were anticipating the coming of the Holy Spirit. They were most likely afraid of the persecution and hostility they had just witnessed against their Lord which led to his crucifixion just several weeks before. And they were most likely still amazed and awestruck at the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. This wait must have been pretty challenging for the time for these original disciples, who ultimately would become the core of the church of Jesus Christ once they received the promised power from on high. During this period of waiting, Peter used the time to find a new disciple to take Judas Iscariot's place. Luke records, And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now, this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, 
and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, Akodama, which is field of blood. Peter continues, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show us which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. It may seem odd to us that they use lots, which is sort of like flipping a coin in a modern sense, but we can be sure that they had a verse in mind when they did it. Proverbs 16.33 explains, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Before the Holy Spirit came, most people, without access to the Urim and the Thummim, that were worn by the high priest, had to rely on prayer and essentially flipping a coin while they trusted that God would control the outcome of heads or tails, essentially, in modern terms. We'll see later that the Holy Spirit actually spoke to them and led them going forward, so this is the last time we see anyone casting lots in the Bible. As we continue our journey into this gospel of the Holy Spirit called the Book of Acts, we will see the coming of Jesus was not the only thing that changed the world 2,000 years ago. The coming of the Holy Spirit also empowered God's people to share the gospel, write the New Testament, do mighty works, and change the world one heart at a time. What an amazing God we serve.